All right, so we concluded the sin teaching. This is now going to be the afterburn. If you have comments or questions about the teaching, you go ahead and line up over here by the podium. Otherwise, online, you can start typing them in, and our Shamish team will take note of those. I hope this teaching was a blessing to all of you to understand this topic. And hopefully you can also understand that we did this after the evil teaching because it's about resetting the lexicon. I mean, if nothing else, we are, we are one of the only ministries out there that are actively making the effort to scripturally, in a sound way, scripturally sound way, reset the lexicon. We have all these terms that we don't understand. Grace, salvation, sin, evil. All these, we don't understand them. Well, we do, but in a wrong way. Okay? So it's a privilege to be able to do some of those things for you. All right, we'll begin with Ashley. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I came up here because before I had to leave, you were talking about um, breach of relationships with um, in people. Um, how do you, before, how do I want to ask this question? When two are, or one person's calling with the other person, the other person's not really calling, they're just like, it is what it is. Um, at what point do you take it to a rabbi and how long, like, should you, I think things, you should try to work things out yourself before you go to a rabbi. And um, I was wondering, um, how long on an issue do you wait to go? All right, I'm a little confused only from the beginning. Is this something that you were the one having strife or you're, or you're an outside third person witnessing the strife? I feel like, well, it's, I'm in it, but I'm not in it. Okay, I'm, so that's, cause that's what I thought you were saying. All right, so let me handle it from both directions. We already talked about it, and you missed part of the teaching because your children, you had to go. So you'll hear it when you get a chance. We already have a protocol that if it's you directly in the strife. But what if you are sort of peripherally kind of being sucked into it or being collateral damage to it? What do you do with that? Well, you can go to your brother. You can go to the people involved only because they have affected you. Now, just being aware of it is not enough. It's just because it's just, just you're aware of it doesn't make it your issue or your business. However, if they come to you and drag you into it, and that may now become something you have to deal with, okay? And in that case, try to stay neutral. Do not take sides. All of you listen really carefully. You will not know and should never take the side of the, per, the first person that tells you what's going on. You will not know what really happened. Please don't get sucked into the empathetic vortex or swirling black hole that sucks you in to their emotional state and now you feel the same negative way about the person that they feel about. Oh, I'm mad too. I can't believe they did that to you. You don't know what happened. Okay? Oh, my friend wouldn't lie to me. No, they believe it. But they could be exaggerating it or filtering it through some real emotional space that makes it look a lot worse than it was or whatever. You're not getting the real truth there. So don't let that happen. So anytime something's going on that you don't know how to handle, maybe you don't know what to do with the two people that are involved and you're sort of kind of dragged in, come, you come to leadership and say, this is what's happening. I, I'm kind of involved. I don't know what to do. I may tell you, leave it alone. Pull your way out of it. I may say, Encourage them, come see me. I, I, it depends on the situation, what it is. So when you say, when should you go to the rabbi? When it says, when a matter arises, when you don't know what to do. Okay, that's Deuteronomy 17. It gives a couple of things, plea against plea and blood against blood and all that. No, look, if something comes up and you don't know what to do, go up the chain of command and find out what to do. Okay? Um, and then my second question is, um, without... Because we shouldn't be talking about our marriage outside of other people, but if we have a, and obviously everyone's going to know who I'm talking about, but uh, if I go to my um, friend um, and just want to vent to them, because I know that person legit is not going to go to anyone else, but we've been coming to this place where it's like, we don't want to hear each other's things, but we do because we want to, like, how do you support someone and listen to them, but without trying to take someone's side? All right. Without um, break and then causing I, a separation. I, of I get that. And make these a little louder. Okay, I get that. So look, here's the thing, all right? First of all, never trust 100% that whatever you say doesn't go any further. 
Some of you are like, oh no, I never share. Listen, there's always that one person you think you could trust that you share with, and then they have one person they think they could trust to share with. So never think for sure that what you say doesn't go any further, because that would be a mistake. All right? Secondly, when it comes to talking about your marriages, okay, or talking about anything that you had a bad, you had a problem with somebody, please start off the conversation with, I'm just venting, if you're just venting. All right? Let them know. I'm not, I'm because if you say you're just venting, I'm not listening to it with the full belief of every detail. I know you're upset and it's a high level of emotion and you're just getting it out. So I'm not worried about the details and just saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that to you because you're upset right now. You may be overreacting. You may be underreacting. Who knows what it is, right? But I know you just need to get it out. So there's no side to take if you're venting. Okay, so all of you, if anybody comes to you and say, look, I'm just venting, please don't take sides. Don't, don't end up getting involved as into thinking this one or that one or this about, th- whatever. Just let them vent and just say when they're done, do you feel better? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and encourage them that they could go deal with whatever it is that they're dealing with or maybe they need to go up the chain and talk to me or something, right, go up the vertical. But start off by letting people know, if you call here, please tell us if you're just venting. Because if you don't tell us, we're either going to tell you, I don't want to hear the story, tell me what the problem is, et cetera, like I always do, and you're going to be frustrated you don't get to vent. Elder will let you vent sometimes. I will even let you vent sometimes because I know you need to sometimes, okay? But tell me that's what you're doing, all right? Because maybe you don't have a person that you trust enough to vent to that person, But listen, if you're gonna continually vent to a friend about your spouse, that person is going to get a negative view of your spouse. And you're gonna get a negative view of theirs if they're doing the same thing to you. So better you should do that up the vertical where we will not, okay? Because we don't have the caring from a friendship point of view with you that your friend does. Because your friend's gonna be much more protective of you, be more likely just to buy into whatever you say, and think your husband's a jerk, or whatever, right? Because you're venting about him. Every one of us who's married can vent about our spouse at some point. There's always stuff that we can vent about. So you gotta be careful. You should always be careful as a spouse that you're not letting anybody in the public think anything negative about your spouse. If it's really that bad, then you bring it up to the ministry. Why would you ever, because I'll tell you what, don't raise your hands. How many of you have ever said anything to anybody negative about your spouse only to be embarrassed because you were actually the one at fault, but you were so upset you just wanted to make them look bad? And don't raise your hand, but you understand what I'm saying. Happens all the time. And then what do you have to do? You gotta call your friend back and say, I'm sorry, it really was my fault, but I was just angry, and so I wanted you to think of how mad I was, what a jerk he was, or she was, or whatever. Don't do that. And never post on Facebook or anywhere when you're in that kind of state of mind. And I say that all the time and it still amazes me how many of you still do that. People out there still posting all this negative junk because they're upset. Please listen. I wish there was like a Torah command. Don't, Don't vent on public forums when you're angry. Okay? You know what the rule, this should be a rule for Facebook and everything else. You know when your parents told you, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all? That should be your posting rules. All right? If you don't have anything nice to say, don't post. If it's not uplifting or encouraging in some way or just a, 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 an innocent enough humorous thing or whatever, don't post. If it's meant as a way to attack, undermine, or cut at somebody and you're hoping people will figure out what you mean, don't post. That's cowardly baby stuff anyway. Okay, you should just contact the person and deal with it straight or let it go. All right, Ashley? So just to make sure I understand, it is still appropriate for me, indeed, to just say ping pong off of each other and just go, go to dad? You can, look, you can still, look, if you have a friend, you're always welcome to share anything you want with your friend. I'm just saying if you're constantly only painting your spouse in a negative way with your, with your friend, your friend's going to start to feel that way about your spouse. And they're not going to feel that good about you if you, after being, I mean, if you make your husband look horrible and then it gets fixed and now you're all wonderful about your husband, your friend's going to wonder, okay, 
this looks a little odd. You hated him last week, and now you think he's the best thing since sliced bread. How'd that happen? Well, because you overreacted. Okay? And so be careful with all that. Okay, good. All right, Pete. Rabbi, I've heard you talk about um, grace being unmerited favor, but it seems like in one teaching you, you kind of backed off of that a little bit, at least initially. No, merited favor, not unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. So, correct. Yeah. So, when we first get our bubble popped, when we first come into this walk, I, I did nothing at all to deserve his attention and his popping my bubble. And I've heard many, many people talk about what horrible people they thought they were, and they certainly did not deserve to be in this walk. Isn't that in some respects unmerited favor? No. Absolutely not. Why did he pop your bubble? Well, none comes but the Father draws. No, 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 no. But why did he pop your bubble? I don't know. Because he plans to pop everybody's bubble. So there's any favor in there. He just selected the timing of it. Can we all agree he's going to pop everybody's bubble? Yeah. All right, so what's the big deal that yours was popped? He picked the timing of yours like he picks the timing of everybody's. There's no grace in that. There's no favor in that. How is it favor if he's going to do it for everybody? Everybody gets a chance. Otherwise, he's a respecter of persons, which he says he's not. Okay, but Christianity taught you otherwise. Okay? No. He picked the moment that was always going to happen, and everybody has their timing in their moment. So there's nothing special about it. Okay? There's nothing special about it. What you have to do is realize that having your bubble popped gives you an opportunity for something special. Because now you are aware of something. You can make choices that can change your life and people around you. That's different. But you didn't have to merit that. And that, that's more, if you want to talk, talk about it, if you really have to go there, more of a compassion, mercy thing. More of a compassion even thing. But he's planning to pop everybody's bubble. Now, it says blessed are those in the first resurrection because we actually have it the hardest. So you may think that you found some favor that he thought you could handle it now. And by the way, you merited that. He knows there's something in you that you can do it now. So he still merited it. He knows you can get there from here. That's merit. If it, wasn't, if it was unmerited, then why would he pop your bubble and why would he have any thoughts that you could actually make it? Just be random bubble popping. And if it's unmerited, why would he pick you and not anybody else at this moment? He picked the ones at this moment that he wanted to pick at this moment because you could get there from this moment. Is that fair for everybody to get that? So stop thinking you're so special because he popped your bubble. He's going to pop everybody's. Just appreciate that since he popped your bubble, you have an opportunity and a responsibility to make some choices that matter. So it's a big deal, yes. It's absolutely a big deal having your bubble pop, but it's not a big deal that yours was popped and somebody else's wasn't. They're all going to get their bubbles popped. Everybody gets to make the same choice of life and death. Does that help? That makes sense? Okay. Really good question. Okay. Good point to make. But I've never backpedaled on the point. Any teaching that doesn't teach that grace is merited favor was done before I did the teaching where I realized it's a merited favor. So there may be something far enough back before I did that teaching. Okay. Because I was under the same impression that I was told like everybody else was that it was unmerited favor. So it's only when I did the search for the doctrine of grace, the newer version, the one we have now. Now, you can ask Uncle Bob, when I did the original teaching of that back in 2000 or 2001 or whenever I did it, that first teaching on the search for the doctrine of grace was only to prove there's no such doctrine. And I went through all the verses to show you that first of all, almost nobody talks about it in the New Testament but Paul. Yeshua never mentions it, but in one section, in one chapter, three verses in a row where he says, if you only love those who love you, what grace is there? So he never talks about it like it's a doctrine. Okay, the rest of the guys almost never talk about it. And I went through how many times each one talked about it, I quoted how many verses there were, and we went through to show it's not taught or expressed anywhere as a doctrine. Okay. Law is not taught as a doctrine either. Law is a covenantal obligation. So it's not doctrine of law versus the doctrine of, of grace. 
Okay? You merit favor, it's not a doctrine. You are obligated to keep the law if you want a covenant, that's not a doctrine. Okay, they're just realities, okay? All right, Chris. Um, I'm excited about your teaching, intro, like uh, introducing MTOI teaching. Um, the lot, I remember it, one, one of my first teachings was your introduction to our ministries teaching about 10 years ago. Right. And even that was a two-part teaching, so it's going to make it hard. <laughs> um, and then you're talking about STDs. I thought it was really interesting because this last week um, I've been getting into the insurance te uh, terminology of everything. Everybody at work talking about all these acronyms I don't know, and they, they toss around STD um, sometimes. And I was, I was like, okay, and I'm just a programmer, so I'm just typing these things in, um, and realized later that it means short-term disability, um, apparently, you know, for them. Um, so I thought the way that we teach, like, um, as, a con as a consequence for us, um, more than just specifically in the sexual things, it could be what co a consequence would be short-term disability, or I was thinking sin transmitted disease as well as different acronyms, just to make that more accessible to people who don't. Um, so that was that. Yeah, for a lot of people, it's stupid thinking daily. <laughs> Ooh, sorry. I'm sorry, that, I, that, I didn't, that came out, that came out loud. Um, and then the other thing I had was for Genesis 4. Um, I'm always looking in the uh, Septuagint when you're talking about the Hebrew, so I can just read uh, along. And a lot of people uh, on, in commentaries talk about how the Hebrew is, um, I mean, debatably corrupt in this area. Like where it says in verse 8, And Cain said to his brother Abel, or Abel, and then in the, the Masoretic it just has a, a period, um, but in the Greek, it says, let us go through the plain. And a lot of Bibles have that part, too, using the Septuagint instead, because the Masoretic is, just doesn't have anything. But in the, in the previous verse that you were covering about the sin crouching at your door, um, I thought it was really interesting because the Septuagint doesn't have that part. And the way it reads was very interesting to me. So it says, and Yahweh said to Cain, why have you become deeply grieved and why has your countenance collapsed? If you offer correctly, but do not divide correctly, have you not sinned? Be still, his recourse is to you, and you will rule over him. And so they were talking about how the do not divide correctly was a part of the offering, um, and how you do the offering. And then it said, be still, and didn't, didn't mention the uh, crouching at the door where the sin is something right. that's coming to you. So I thought that was an interesting way um, of, of uh, resolving that problem, I guess, with the text. No, no, it's very good. Look, I had gone through, I don't want to call it a struggle, a journey at, at, some, at some point, you know, through, through the last 25 years of trying to assess where the issues are in terms of the, the foundational. And what I mean by that is, is the Masoretic better or worse? Is the Septuagint better or worse? I mean, where do you look to? Is the Aramaic better or worse? Who, who has the, the more accurate deal? Because they don't match in a lot of ways. All right, the Septuagint does, definitely doesn't match in a lot of different places to what the Masoretic does. Uh, do I think they all have issues? Probably to whatever degree. And so the challenge is that almost everything that we use scripture-wise, Bible-wise, is based on the Masoretic. So they don't read the same as we get in the Septuagint. I happen to have started to come to the belief that the Septuagint has a better translation, okay? Even though almost everybody's using the Masoretic. The Masoretes had an agenda. They're the ones that changed and took Yahweh's name out all these times that it was there and put things in like Adonai, etc. They had their own agenda, okay? I'm not saying the guys who, who you know, the, the quote unquote 70 rabbis who translated the, the, you know, the Old Testament into, into Greek didn't have an agenda. I mean, there's the legend that they all did it exactly the same and they were doing it independently and that's where the Septuagint comes from, okay? So, um, you know, who knows, okay? We don't have a way to definitively answer that. So when, when Chris comes up and quotes from that, I, I do appreciate it because, you know, we are handicapped by what we are given. This is what we have available to us. The word was perfect when it was given. Unfortunately, we do not have a perfect copy of that to read from, okay? 
I don't have any problem believing the word was inerrant as delivered. We just, this is not as it was delivered. Mostly probably, but not as delivered, right? And so I am confident we can glean what we need to out of it. There's no doubt in my mind. And so it's, it's, it is helpful. And look, when I do the translation that I keep promising at some point we'll get to, you know, that one will probably have a lot more of the Septuagint uh, worked into that in those places than the Masoretic, okay? I'll be looking at as all different sources to try to see which, you know, actually seems to be more accurate to what we're saying, okay? Okay, so. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a verse in the Psalms where it talks about a body you've prepared for me, but that's in the Septuagint, but in the, in the um, Masoretic it says, my ears you've opened. Oh, that's very different. <laughs> because remember, the Masoretes were trying to hide anything Yeshua had pointing. They had an agenda. Just like the New Testament early church fathers wanted to hide Torah observance. And everybody messed with what they could mess with as best they could. I'm not trying to undermine your confidence in your book. I wouldn't teach the way I do if I didn't have confidence, okay? Matter of fact, I took seven years off when I didn't have confidence. I needed some answers to some of the issues. All right, and then I came back in 2010 and started teaching again with the confidence. And so let's just, you know, so just understand, I've been on this journey. All right, Shamash Gary. Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Um, something you touched on about the, uh, you know, uh, being known and appointed and being uh, one of those speakers out there and so many other voices out there on the internet. So just something I had spoken with some people a while back and, you know, you look out there and you think, man, is there anybody else speaking this? You know, is there anybody else teaching these things? And something that came to mind was, you know, in Elijah, was, he's fearing that he's the only one. And Yahweh tells him, he says, 7,000 men have not bowed and they need a ball. And I thought about it and I'm like, you know, there could be all kinds out there. But for me, okay, I had certain things that I went through and I realized there were certain things that wasn't right that was being taught when we were in the church and things. And there's one, one person came along and I've, there's like a list of eight or 10 things. And you're aware of the, the thing that I did where I have like the paradigm shifts that, to me, I was like, this is not what I'm hearing. And then when I'm sitting here reading and studying on my own, because that's all I had, I just realized there's something wasn't right, that suddenly one person comes along and hits all those things, opens it even more, okay? And I can't deny that. This is why you're my teacher. This is why I call you rabbi. And I don't care if there's 7,000 other people out there because I didn't, I, he showed me one. He didn't show me 7,000 and one, right. he showed me one. Right. And yeah. so I know that in the past when, you know, especially being in Ohio, some of the people I've dealt with, and you remember the individual that was having a struggle with the, you know, the father and son. And we had a discussion one day, I'm sitting there and you know, you also have the in focus, should I study my Bible? And I told that person then, I said, you know, it, if you believe this is where he has brought you to, you need to take, just relax and take a breath. Because if he's brought you here, meaning the father, then this is a safe place. He would not take you somewhere that's not and allow the teacher to teach and take the questions to him and so on and so forth. But this constant um, looking and then of course, the studying leads to, oh, I'm gonna go on YouTube and find somebody else. You know, let, let's see what somebody else is saying about this. And again, as you've said, you'll find somebody who's teaching what Anything. it is that you want to. Sure. And that person, last time I heard, eventually denied Messiah and then it went off into nothing. It's, and it's like, we also knew somebody else that did that <laughs> and led a group. And you told people, this is where that leads because you did go on your journey. And I don't understand why, if you believe this is the one that Abba put in front of you, why are you looking? You don't have time to look because I'm telling you, there's a lot out there that Rabbi has put out and you got a lot of homework to do. Right. And constantly people who've been here for years asking questions, I'm like, what have you been doing? Right. There's a teaching for that and it's not hard. It's on YouTube, it's free. There's a little search button there. Just type in your question, put in some key words, and it's going to find it for you. And then you got work to do. Get busy. And I just don't understand. Right. Why are you looking? Maybe it's because you really haven't come to that conclusion this is where you're supposed to be. That's fine, too. But figure it out. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Gary.
Look, you know, I appreciate that very much. Look, here's the thing. I learn, by li I like to listen to stuff, okay? I mean, I'm a very visual person, but I do like to listen because I'm usually doing something else that I'm looking at while I'm listening. I listened to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teachings when I was first coming into belief in anything, when I was in my 20s, you know, when I started off. I mean, I could not get enough. I had to devour. Just trying to figure it out, I needed to listen to stuff. I, when it comes to personal development, any topic, I want to find the experts that are out there and listen so I can learn. And I would love to listen to teachings. And I know you guys love to listen to teachings, so you tell me all the time, hey, you listen to the teachings all the time, the ones that I've done. But I want to listen to some that other people are doing. I want, I want to be stimulated in that way and edified and instructed and guided and inspired, etc. And so I end up having to listen to the junk that's out there from the point of view just needing to be aware of what other people are teaching so I can be able to share it with you guys. Because otherwise, you know, I couldn't be the watchman that way. But I'd rather balance that out at least somewhat by not having to torture myself listening to this other stuff and have something actually to listen to. So that was kind of the point I was, I was trying to make, you know. And believe it or not, you know, I'll go back and listen to my own teachings if I, if I came down to it. But it's, you gotta, I don't know if you can understand this. It's weird listening to yourself, okay? It just is. I mean, every day I walk into the building, I'm playing on the screen in the lobby. It's a little strange, okay? <laughs> um, and so just understand that that's where that's coming from. All right, Rocky. Thank you, Rabbi. <clears throat> I want to make sure I got this right. So <clears throat> I said a, a week ago or so that, you know, Elohim is in two forms, the Father and the Son, and Yeshua is the the form of Elohim. And um, I'm, in, I'm in two forms. I'm in this Esau, which is this physical man who gave up his birthright for a meal. And then I'm also, I'm, I'm Jacob. And, and Jacob, it, it means that he will, he will rule as God's capital G. So I'm the spiritual man. This, this, um, this, um, Authentic self is the Father, and I'm supposed to walk as the Father. So, uh, where am I going with? I hate when I lose the track of thought. I hate well, that. let me help you. Okay, Thank so, you. so, but Jacob's name was changed to Israel. To Israel. And Israel means that he's the one who overcame and is striving, striving with his flesh and also striving with Elohim. In other words, he overcame the striving problem. He won the battle over flesh, and he also won the battle with not being able to submit to the above because he was striving against the above, and he was striving with the flesh. And now he had to strive against the flesh and with the above. And so he had his name changed when he figured out the problem. Right. Maybe that's what you're dealing with. Yeah, that, that makes sense. The transition to Israel from being Jacob and Esau in one body. Right. Well, I'm just going to quit at that. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Look, that's what it sounded like you were trying to say to me, is that you had these two things and you didn't understand how to bring them together. Okay, so good. All right. Um, so you, that, that's, you know how elders always talking about how those things happen? That's one of those things, okay? It's just an insight that, that I get. And he gave me the two thumbs up that that was what he was trying to say. It's not easy to put the words out there. Thankfully, you don't have to. Just start the thing going, and, and often Abba will just give me the insight to know what it is you're trying to say anyway. All right? And so that's just, you know, so often the, the number one thing people say when they sit down with me is, well, I don't know where to start. And I always say the same thing, just start. Doesn't matter where you start, just start. You'll end up where you're supposed to be eventually. Just get the words going, right? All right, Rob, whatever you got online, you got a couple minutes real quick. Yes, sir. MTO Odessa, Annabelle, am I seeing this correctly? Was the Talmud the law library that could refer to, like we refer to the law library here in the U.S.? On, hand, how, on handling things? No. No, I'm saying is when you look at, from a secular point of view, what a law library looks like, okay, it's just bookcases full of statutes and laws and cases and everything as compared to having a very simple law. Now, the Talmud did try to become that. So, yes, that wasn't what I was referring to, but the Talmud was the Jewish communities over centuries of time coming up with case law and writing down what they 
believe with Deuteronomy 17 type decisions. In other words, the situation would come up, you get to actually read in the Talmud how they argued about it. Not always is there a conclusion as what they decided to do, which is actually something most people don't realize. They think, oh, it's all these laws. Well, no, a lot of it's just arguing. Okay, and making a case for this way or that way. So it's not arguing, but a debate. Well, this one made this point, and this one made this point, and it doesn't necessarily mean they decided anything. All right? But so, um, so no, I was not referring to the law library here in the U.S. as, as that. Okay, uh, the, the Talmud, well, I guess the way you're saying it is, was the Talmud law library similar to what I'm talking about? Yes, it would be similar to that. It gets, but it's, it's, the law that we have in a law library here is applicable to everyone who lives in this country if you're a citizen here, whereas the Talmud is not actually applicable to everybody. It's, it's their opinions on understanding how to put fences around the law or interpret the law, and that's, they're welcome to their opinion, okay? I may even agree with a lot of their opinions. It not, doesn't matter if I agree with them or not, okay? Rob. From Rena Zimmerman, Matthew 18, verse 17. Let him be to you like the nations and a, and a tax collector. What does this mean? How should we treat those who refuse to hear us? All right. So that's a really good verse that I, I'm sorry I left it out because when I got to Deuteronomy 17, I should have covered that. So in Matthew 18, when he mentions at the end of that verse that you should treat them like a, like, you know, like they're uh, a tax collector out in the nations, etc. Let me explain what that's talking about. So in Deuteronomy 17, it says, those who act arrogantly, you're basically supposed to kill them or put them out of the camp. You're supposed to, I mean, this is a problem in the nation. So when Matthew, is, when Yeshua is addressing this in Matthew 18, he's basically saying, look, these people are a problem, let them be like a Gentile, like one of the nations and a tax collector, which means he knew how they felt about tax collectors and Gentiles. He says, well, fine, you should feel the same about someone who won't listen. Because at this point, it's already gone to the assembly, which made it a Deuteronomy 17 issue. All right? It's not saying treat them badly. If you go to them, they don't listen to you. After it's fully escalated, is what we're talking about in verse 17, then it becomes a Deuteronomy 17. But at this point, they didn't have, because they were maybe under Roman authority, they couldn't just go out there and stone somebody and say, oh, well, it's because they weren't listening and the Sanhedrin made a decision, or the, the, the priest made a decision or something. Okay? And so it wasn't so simple. But that's, hopefully, Raina, that answers the question. Okay? And that's Raina, not Rena, but okay. I know her. All right. What else? Okay. From Gabby, in contrast to the vertical structure where, where there is one authority, how do we approach a horizontal relationship breach with a person in authority when we are the person under their authority? How do we approach a horizontal relationship with a person in authority when we are the person under their authority? That's where you go to another person on that person's level if they're above you, or they go above both of them. Always keep going up the chain, okay? Now, if, you're, if your problem is me, well, now you have a problem. <laughs> no place else to go, okay? But you could go to Elder and ask him if he has any ideas of how to handle it. And he may be able to give you guidance and advice in helping resolve that. And people have done that often. <laughs> okay? And we do usually get to a thing. Here, here's the funny thing, though. And you can ask Elder, and he will absolutely back this up. You have no idea, those of you who never give me the chance, how nice I can be, how patient I can be, I've had so many people, even just this week, last week, whatever, on the phone that I could have just written off and said, go away. But I, once I got them calmed down, I fixed it, restored it, allowed this thing to be healed. And he'll look at me like, I can't believe, because I surprise him when I do that, even though he expects it now more, because it looks like I'm just gonna, and I'm ready to basically throw in the towel a lot of the times, but I realize that's not the thing to do. So whatever problem you may have with me, if you would only seek to fix it, it would get fixed. You just don't think it would, because you you've never seen me in that role, in that mode, okay? But he watched me with my finger hovering over the hang-up button. Okay, because we'll be on speakerphone, the two of us sitting in his office, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm done, this is nonsense, and I'm ready to hit the hang-up button, okay? 
All right? And by the way, for all of you out there, if I hang up on you, I'm not mad. I'm not angry. I'm just tired of this. We're not getting anywhere. There's no point. So just take it as that. Okay? Don't take it like, oh, he was so rude and I'm not, no, you were already being whatever. And I just couldn't deal with it anymore. You weren't listening. So if you're not going to listen, I'm just going to hang up. Well, that seems kind of childish. No, it's kind of actually effective and efficient and not wasting time. Because here's the problem with the people that like to argue and don't listen. You like to argue and don't listen, so you never stop. So the only choice I have is to just go click, which I did to two people in the same day, back-to-back -back phone calls. <laughs> Elder will tell you, he's like, that was pretty good. And it was back-to-back. -back. Now, bear in mind, one called back and apologized. The other one never called back. All right? It happens. Okay? Some of you think, man, look, I'm a real person. I don't, I don't live by what your thoughts of what the rules are for my position. Okay? I try to do it the most effective way I can. And I have to deal with more nonsense than you can ever imagine. <laughs> Elders like nodding. You can, I'm telling you, if we wrote it down and filmed it, you would think we like staged it and made it up like Hollywood or something. There would, there's no way it could really be what we deal with. I'm, I mean, I tell them all the time we should do a reality show, you know, a ministry reality show. Nobody would believe it. They think we're writing it somewhere in a booth, in a back room with writers making stuff up. I'm serious. You, you just have no idea what we deal with. Most of it's n normal stuff. Don't get me wrong. But do we, have, we have those moments. Sometimes it's a whole day of those moments that we just look like it's another Monday, you know. And you couldn't believe it. But what you also wouldn't believe if you were to see me handling things is that, sure, I lose my temper sometimes. I get frustrated sometimes. But if you, if you actually genuinely want to fix it, I will fix it. Okay? And elders, the camera should be on his face doing this, but you're not going to have that. But I'm just saying, it would fix, okay? But you have to know that. But you have to give it a chance. So if there's a horizontal breach of relationship, first of all, it's not horizontal if the relationship is with someone above you. It's a vertical problem, okay? So it doesn't actually work that way, all right? If your horizontal problem is the person in authority over you, it's really a vertical problem. Okay, it's still not a problem with Yahweh necessarily, but it is a vertical problem. It's not like going to your brother and you're on the same level. You have a different problem when the person above you is the problem that you're having, right? So go to somebody on that person's level or on the next level that you can go to and say, how should I handle it? Get advice from someone in leadership. Don't come just yelling and screaming about me or elder or whoever you're mad at. Go to somebody else in leadership and say, look, I, I, it seems like I'm having a problem. I don't know what to do. And they will give you the right guidance on how to handle that. All right? I will tell you right now, I have never, ever, ever rejected anybody's offer genuinely to restore relationship. Never. I have gotten done with and hung up buttons on people that have shown no interest in restoring relationship or being or listening or anything like that or having any interest. So go do that somewhere else. And I have no problem telling all of you that there are a few people I wish would just go away. Not go away like never get into the kingdom. Just go bother somebody else. Okay? You're not going to listen to me. Go listen to somebody else. Okay? Stop wasting elder's time, my time, Rabbi Tom's time. We've got a couple of people wasting our time. And by wasting, I mean you will not take guidance. You will not do what we say. You won't listen. Elder, I hear him on the phone a lot. And by the way, for all of you, his door is open a lot. My door is open a lot. I am listening. Okay? He knows that. You should know that. We should have that disclaimer. By the way, this call may be monitored for, I'm listening. Okay? And so don't get all upset if I all of a sudden, you hear my voice. Because sometimes the nonsense is too much for me to hear him dealing with it. I walk over and say, hi, let's fix this. We're going around in circles. We're going around this mountain too long. And then you're like, oh. You think he brought me in? He didn't bring me in. Okay? Sometimes he's sitting there going, when are you going to come in already, Rabbi? <laughs> I opened my door. You can hear this. You know? And I'll go in, and sometimes I'll go in and I'll hover around deciding whether or not I want to get involved or not. 
because it's close, and I'm watching him handle it, because I'm also training him, and, and, and I don't always step in necessarily because he couldn't handle it. I just feel like it may need that authoritative step in, shut the noise down, get this thing moving in a different direction. The venting time is over. You were venting and venting, and okay, let's fix this. All right, enough. And I'm, I, I come in and I'm definitely the noise stopper, okay? Because if the noise doesn't stop, I hang up and you can have all the noise you want by yourself, okay? And some of you are like, man, I can't believe you hang up on people. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry you can't believe that, okay? <laughs> but you need to know I don't do it angry. He'll see, he'll look at me like, and I just went, and I go, okay, next, and we move on. And I, I, I'm never mad. I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous, I'm done, boom, okay? <laughs> You know, but it's only if somebody's just absolutely not listening. They're going around in circles, they're interrupting, they won't let us talk, they're not letting us say anything, okay? And we're just going around in the circle that's just not good. So fine, you know. Anyway, look, I'm open and honest about how I do things, and so, you know, I don't think you'd ever have a pastor or rabbi tell you those kind of things, they'd be willing to say that, but I'm just letting you know this is how we operate. And you should be okay with that. It's all to your benefit. So if you get hung up on, you need to be asking the question, what was I doing that caused that? I guess I was emotionally out of control, just not listening, and so I probably need to call and apologize and say, I think I misrepresented what I was trying to do. Can we start again? And I always will say yes. Elder will say that. I will always say yes if you come back with the right attitude, ready to start again. All right? Simple as that. All right, I don't know how we ended up on all of that, but you know, it's good. Some of you now are gonna be wondering if I'm just sitting there ready on the button every time you call. It doesn't happen that often, okay? No, no more than at least two or three times a day. No, it really, it really, I think I've only done it like three times ever. Just two of them were in the same day. Okay, it doesn't happen very often at all. I think I've only hung up on people like, in the last year, maybe three times, okay, four times at the most, all right? Twice was that one day. It was funny. It was back-to-back -back calls. Anyway. Hi, everyone. Hi, children. Welcome back. All right. So we're going to go ahead and end the service. <laughs>